So right. Dave, it's yeah. been a lot of fun having you with us and I really appreciate what you brought to our uh, program this week. So part of what the Center for Online Innovation and Learning does, COIL, is we have a program called uh, COIL Perspectives. And our intent is to get the insights from leaders such as you about online learning, about the future, and, and um, so we ask a series of questions. The first is for you to frame for us what you think only three to five years out. And we use that time intentionally because describing anything beyond that is conjecture. Sure. So we're, we're hoping to get to what might actually either you hope to see or you think might actually happen. Why don't we start there? I think that's, that's an interesting question, and first, let me thank you for hosting me this last My week. My pleasure, thank you. Um, I like that time frame because I think education, as we know it, is is change. We don't. We know it's we know it's change. Everyone, I think, recognizes the need for change, but nobody knows what it's going to be. So I think you're right. Settling on that three to five year time frame is an ideal thing. That said, what I would hope to see in those three to five years is an opening up of education. Mm. I think um, from my perspective working in Alaska, we have a lot of rural students. And, and just like you would have rural students all around the globe. And what we need to be better at is engaging those students where they are, getting away from the model of everything has to be on campus and expanding distance education. Obviously, that's not a new theme. But I think how we do that is what we need to consider in the programs we put. Um, it's really it's going to have to move to a more student-centered focus. And we're going to have to put in new programs and use new tools and create more partnerships to really innovate the business and figure out how we can meet the students where they are, take advantage of what they know, mm -hmm. and supplement that rather mm -hmm. than necessarily forcing them to come into a campus or any classroom and, and fit a specific model. So you're seeing a more learner-defined model of education rather than an institutionally defined model. Yeah. yeah. No, I, obviously, you know, if we look at higher education, it is, as much as I hate to say it, it is a business. Mm -hmm. And there is a place for the enterprise and the efficiencies it can bring. Well, I think what we have to do is merge those two. Mm -hmm. I think for education, at least higher education, to, to really grow and expand is to look at those other models of business and how we can't focus, <coughs> excuse me, on our, on our customers, I hate, again, I hate to use the sure. word customers, yeah. but focus on the students and their needs and what they are mm -hmm. to drive our business mm -hmm. rather than them forcing them to conform to us right. and really putting them first. And we spend a lot of time thinking about our students and how we try to engage our students in our classrooms. And we need to flip that and figure out, okay, if our students, they all have a specific backgrounds, unique needs, unique situations, how can we adapt what we're doing to meet them and get take them to where they want to go. Yeah. So I, I love the vision, and, and uh, I'm just wondering about what are the things that are going to stop us from achieving that? What are the barriers or challenges you might see to that, to that kind of a learner-centered model right. of education? I think the biggest challenge, um, again, my own perspective, I mm -hmm. think the biggest challenge is the the model of education we have now need, needs to effectively change, but it, the, the people working within that model are resistant to it. Mm. It mainly goes to, I do a lot of work with faculty development, um, and working with specifically older faculty, they all say, oh, that online stuff, it's too difficult, mm. or it's too much time. And I try to explain to them, it's not that it's more difficult or takes too much time, it's different. Yeah, right. And you, it, people are uncomfortable with that difference. And so we need to get beyond that. Um, and we need, we need to have leaders in place. We need innovative ideas that can change the culture of education. And I think once we change the culture, then we'll be able to do a lot more things much more efficiently and quickly. So for, for emerging or engaged leaders in this field, what do you think are some of the characteristics? How do we change our mindsets as leaders in order to sort of guide things through to a vision that you've described? I've been wondering about that myself. <laughs> I, I, I would like to hear your answer on that. Mm. Um, I think as a leader in online education, you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. You have to be, to ask the questions that nobody else is willing mm. to ask and be able to be comfortable to fail. I think 
personally, I don't think we encourage failure enough. Um, my team was looking for a new name, and I wanted to come up with some an acronym that spelt fail. Just, mm, mm. I think it's only by failing that we can truly discover what we're doing. I think mm. too many times leaders, a lot of leaders nowadays, especially more established in higher education, they're afraid of that failure. So I think we need to look at, at encouraging innovative ideas and that environment of culture change to, to take those, to try an idea. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be anything big, but to at least incorporate that failure is okay. Mm -hmm. um, recognize that mistakes are gonna be made mm -hmm. and be a comfortable enough leader to work with your team because obviously it's not a one person shop sure. to make that happen. So if I could just offer a slight twist on that, you're saying encouraging people to fail. I think what you said toward the end, which I liked a bit more, frankly, was that you're making an allowance for if failures occur, it's okay. It's part of a learning experience right. rather than it being a punitive right. effort. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not saying we want to fail. Right, right. Uh, if we look at higher education, and especially if you look at scholarly journals, and what's getting written about, it's what people perceive as our successes. Right, right, right. Um, but if you ask any teacher, a lot of people, you learn almost as much, if not more, from the failures. Sure. And I don't think we're, I don't think we recognize that as much, especially yeah. as you seem to move up into the administrative chain. Right, right. Because you feel a sense of responsibility to your right. constituents and, and the students, and ultimately, if you're a public institution, you, you know, the state you're working with. Sure. Wonderful. Well, I just want to thank you for making what I happen to know is a long trip uh, <laughs> to join us and to bring everything you did uh, to the program this week. It's been wonderful. And thank you for your insights today. Oh. Really appreciate it. Dave. Thank you. Come back thank to you. Alaska. My pleasure. I'd love to. <laughs> thank you.